All right, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on. We're excited you're joining with us wherever you're at, Cal State, Bakersfield, Northwest, or even in the outdoor courtyard. This has been an amazing year, you guys. Uh, there's packed in here. We got people in our, in our courtyard overflow online joining us and our other campuses. We have grown, just this year, we have grown um, by 30%, you guys. Amazing. Not only like, like, and that's awesome that we're seeing, but that is also translated to more than ever. We've actually doubled the amount of salvations this year and over doubled the amount of baptisms. We had 208, 253 last year. We have 518 baptisms this year. Come on, celebrate what God is doing. So awesome. So I got a cool announcement with you guys because um, we're seeing so much growth and Christmas is upon us and the new year. We're about to expand one more time. We're adding one more worship service to our schedule. We're going to open up a day, though, Saturday at 6.30 p.m. We're offering a new worship experience uh, that's in the new year on January 6th. January 6th. This is an amazing opportunity. There's so many people, I think, who do not come to Sunday because they can't. For whatever reason, they can't. There's another group of people who probably who are unchurched or de-churched who just don't like Sunday because it's associated with church, that maybe they come to Saturday because it's just not Sunday and it's on a night. So I think it's going to be a great evangelistic service. So check it out. If you want to join us on Saturday, and this is honestly, this service and the 1130 service is a service I hope will take me up in the offer most because it's the most packed services. If you want to join us, I'd love to know, to know what that uh, expectation would be. Let me know, scan the QR code. Let me know if number one, you want to attend, or two, you'd like to serve. Even if you don't serve right now, you're like, you know what, I'd love to maybe get connected and serve at that new service. Let's go, you can join the team, or if you're on a team, we'll, you know, take you from that team, put you on a new team, okay? So whatever you want to do there, attend our serve, scan that QR code, let us know. You guys, it's one week till Christmas, man. This is so awesome. It's, it's, it's right here. Let me just tell you, because you are the biggest crowd, 945 and 1130. 11:30 is a little bit bigger than you, by the way, just, just a little bit. But uh, let me encourage you guys that are here. We've got tons of services to prayerfully consider not coming to the 945 service <laughs> on Sunday, Christmas Eve. Okay, because there's a, I got a bunch of services for you to come to, but this is the service that a lot of guests come to, this one in, in 1130. So by coming to a, a different service, different time, you're opening up some of those seats for others to experience Christmas at Discovery as well. So prayerfully consider that. Um, that's just an easy way to make your pastor happy, okay? Come to, come to one of those afternoon services or something. Or we have two services on Saturday, 430 and 630 as well coming up. Man, I'm stoked for that. We're in this, in the ninth installment of the series, The Names of God. The name I'm going to share with you today is the name that is the, the last name God reveals to his people. It's the final name in the Old Testament that, that God gives as a revelation of who he is. Now remember, he gives the names intentionally so that we could relate to him um, personally. So he's, he's offering, this is who I am and how I want you to relate to me. And this is the final name we get before the name becomes flesh and dwells among us on Christmas. And that's what I'm going to share with you. I can't wait for Christmas at Discovery to talk about that. But the very last verse of a book in the Old Testament, a prophetic book in the Old Testament, written by the prophet Ezekiel with that name, Ezekiel. He was a prophet in the time of Israel when they were in Babylonian captivity. All right, they were, they were in Babylon. They were, they were taken captive. They were in exile. And uh, Ezekiel is prophesying to the people who are in exile about a time when God would bring them back. And then we get the revelation of his name where he's describing the city and Jerusalem and the blessing and the provision, and the protection of God that will be on this place again, once again. In Ezekiel chapter 48, the very last verse actually of the book of Ezekiel is where we get the revelation of this name. Verse 35, the final verse in the book of Ezekiel it says this, and the name of the city from that day shall be Jehovah Shammah. Someone say Shammah. Shammah. Okay, this means the Lord is there. Oh, how many of you, you would love to live your life in such a way where people look at it and say, wow, God's got to be there. 
Come on, how many of you want that kind of life? How many of you want your home to be marked by that, where, where people go, wow, man, that home, that family, God is, God is there in that. How many of you want for Discovery Church, anyone in a Discovery family that just want to have a community here, a church here where people go, I don't know what's going on, but God is there, amen? This, is, this was a distinctive of the people of Israel, though. It's what separated them from all the other nations and cultures. It is the presence of God. The people, all the other cultures would look on who worshiped other gods. These demons, we are told even, these are false gods and idols that they were worshiping. They would look on, on Israel and say, that's Yahweh's land. That's, that's, Jehovah, that's Yahweh's people. That's Jehovah's people. You don't mess with that. You don't go in there. You don't mess with Jehovah's people, man, because God is there. This is what made them strong, blessed, protected, and distinct among all the other nations is because God was there, Jehovah Shammah. But something happened, which was actually a cycle. If you read throughout the New Testament, there is a cyclical pattern of the history of Israel. They would host the presence of God, the glory of God. So they would be blessed and protected, and they'd see his provision and harvest, but then they would go and drift away from God's promises and his presence and his worship false idols. They go through this cyclical pattern of, of just drifting away from God. This is a, a prophet who's, who's prophesying of a time where God's actually going to be there again because he's not there. Right now, that J Jerusalem is ransacked, it's burned. Can you imagine that? Like he's talking to a people who at once time was at the height of all civilization. They were the admiration of all the cultures and peoples and lands. And that's Jehovah's people. That's that you don't mess with them only to in another stage of life for people who worship false gods and idols to come into their land, destroy the temple, rob the, the Ark of the Covenant, destroy. Like, like this is almost unfathomable that this would happen. How would God let this happened. We're a place where he dwelled. Well, it tells us earlier in the book of Ezekiel what actually happened. How did they get to this place where God used to dwell and we have protection and provision and blessing, but now where'd he go? In, in Ezekiel chapter um, 10, verse 18, it said this actually, the, the scripture, it, this is known as the, the day that God moved out. This is what it's known in Israel as the day God moved out of Jerusalem. Look what it says. Then the glory of the Lord moved out of the temple. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine God packing up his bags? And going, hey, well, I, 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 my time's over here. And it almost might be hard for you to imagine something like that because we, we, know, we know the presence of God. And in fact, so you don't get confused because we're told all throughout the scriptures to seek the presence of God and to seek the glory of God. And, and so you, we have to understand something about God's presence for you to understand Jehovah Shammah today. And, and, and what I hope to do today is to um, help you understand Jehovah Shammah a little bit, how you can actually get uh, an experience like where God is, where, where God is real in your life, there, the glory of God in your life. I hope that's where I lead you, but I need to kind of lay some groundwork with you guys about the presence of God, because there's three different types. This isn't in your notes. There's three different types of the presence of God. The first is the omnipresence, and this is what a lot of you are familiar with, where God is everywhere. He's everywhere at all times. Even when we don't realize God is there, he's there, okay? So D David said in the Psalms, where can I go from your presence? If I go up to heaven or in Sheol, in, the, in hell, you're like, I cannot run from your presence. You are there. That's the omnipresence, but you can't seek or pursue the omnipresence. So when God desires you and asks for you to seek him, he's not talking about his omnipresence. There's also the second type of a presence is the inner presence where God is living in us, those who have accepted Christ as a Lord and Savior. We become temples, 1 Corinthians tells us in verse 6, verse 19, chapter 6, verse 19, that, that we are temples of the living God. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, but you cannot seek the inner presence. That is a seal of the promise that will never leave you nor forsake you, that you are ch uh, God's child, okay? That's, he, he lives inside of you. You are his temple, okay? But there's a third type of presence 
That's very important that when God says to seek me, seek me, seek my glory, he's talking about the manifest presence. This is, see, the inner presence is, is God, his presence, the Holy Spirit in us. The manifest presence is God's glory on us. Not, not on in us, but it is on us. It is, is uh, uh, his manifest means to the made known, realized presence of God. In the scriptures, it's this presence that's often interpreted as the glory of God. This is what God desires us to seek. And it's one of the greatest privileges of a child of God to learn to be people who can host the, the glory, the manifest presence of God. See, he's inside of all of us based on the covenant, but he's on manifested upon all of us based on something else that we need to understand today. The challenge that we face is to be, learn to be people that, that host the presence of God as our greatest calling. In Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 6, it tells us um, what actually happened here. How did, how did God, why did God move out? Why, why did the glory of God, we talk about the God moving out, it's not, he's always present, he's everywhere. I'm talking about the glory of God that rested on the land, that rested and protected the people. What happened here? It says this, uh, God said to Ezekiel, son of man, that's what God would call him. That was his affectionate term for Ezekiel. Son of man, do you see what they're doing? Uh, the utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will look what it says, drive me far from my sanctuary. There were some things that they were doing that, that God says, look, I cannot cohabit that space that you're inviting demons to occupy. I can't, I, you are driving me, my glory. Look, I love you, you're my child. You got my, I'm always present, but my glory is, you're shoving me out, son. You're shoving me out. So how, how there's three reasons why God moved out of Israel. And there are three reasons I think why maybe we could check our own heart today, why the glory, when I say moved out, please hear me. God will never leave you nor forsake you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. When I say move out, I'm talking about the glory, the manifest presence of God, that blessing, provision, protection, made real presence that God actually wants you to seek, that he wants you to walk in his glory and his presence. The reason why you might be pushing out the presence of God, that glory from your life. Three reasons, the reasons the Israelite did. Number one, you're seeking other gods. You're seeking, and this is what they did. They started worshiping other gods, other idols. It starts out as there's this word called syncretism. And that's where it starts for Israel every time. And that's where it starts for us. Syncretism is where, where we borrow the customs and the culture, and we kind of add it to our own custom culture and religious practices. So they still have the temple. We still offer sacrifices, but then we also have Baal because he actually helps us out too. And I got Asherah too over here. We got these poles for Asherah because we like her too. And she offers some things that we like in our life. And so I'll continue to go to the temple, but I'll continue to look at porn. I'll continue to go to church, but I'll just cheat on, on without no one knowing. I'll, I'll continue. So it's, it's, it's this syncretistic practice and Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. God can't act, you occupy that space anymore. You're, you're shoving glory out of your life by inviting idols to take space in your heart. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse six, he says, God says, therefore say to the people, people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, repent and turn from your idols and renounce your detestable practices. Let me give you a definition of, of an idol. An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart or your imagination more than God. In anything that you seek to give you what only God can give you is an idol. Okay, and by that definition, like your family and children can be an idol. Your career or making money can be an idol. Achievement and success or popularity can become idols. Your romantic relationship or even friendships can become idolatrous. Your co competence or skill can become an idol. Secure and, and comfort living could become an idol. Your beauty or your brains can become an idol. Uh, you know, the, a great political or social cause can become your idol. So even success in your particular ministry can become your idol. An idol is whatever you look at and you say in your heart, if I have that, 
then I'll feel my life has meaning. That, it, that if I have that, then I'll feel significant or successful or secure if I just had that. That is an idol. And as you invite that into your heart, you're driving out the glory of God from your life. Tim Keller says in his book, Counterfeit Gods. If you have not read that, put that on your reading list maybe for next year. 2024 reading list. Counterfeit Gods by Tim Keller. Let me read you a section of his book. He says, to, to contemporary people, the, world, I, the word idolatry conjures up pictures of primitive people bowing down before statues. Our contemporary society is not fundamentally different, though, from the ancient ones. Each culture is dominated by its own set of idols. Each has its priesthoods, its totems, and its rituals. Each one has its shrines, whether office towers, spas and gyms, studios, or stadiums, where sacrifices must be made in order to procure the blessings of the good life it promises and ward off disaster. What are the gods of beauty, power, money, and achievement but these same things that have assumed mythic proportions in our individual lives and in our society. We may not physically kneel uh, before the statue of Aphrodite, goddess of beauty, but many young women today are driven into depression and eating disorders by an obsessive concern over their body image. We may not actually burn incense to Artemis, the goddess of fertility and wealth, but when money and career are raised to cosmic proportions, we perform a kind of child sacrifice, neglecting family and community to achieve a higher place in business and gain more wealth and prestige. One of the ways that God, his glory, the manifest presence could move Jehovah Shammah, not be in our life anymore is because idols have taken space in your heart and you've shoved out glory. The second reason is you're in the wrong place. And we see this in Israel as well. I don't know, have you ever, um, how many of you have ever stepped out of the will of God and his presence did not go with you in that place? Anyone want to admit that? Okay, you just kind of, it could have been a boyfriend. It could have been a job. It could have been a little, pra like a practical place. You stepped in, you said, man, I stepped out of that. I stepped out of it. And you look back with 2020, there are places, like places where God says, I'm not there. That you can actually walk out of the glory uh, there's a few examples of this in the scriptures, and, and I don't have enough time to dissect them all, but you can go read. The first example I have is in Joshua chapter 7, the battle of AI. It's spelled AI, but it doesn't mean artificial intelligence, okay? The battle of AI is a place. It was actually the battle that happened right after Jericho. Very, very famous battle where the walls of Jericho came tumbling down after the worship cry and shout of all the Israelites. Well, what happened was Joshua does not seek God about the next battle to go into. He rushes into that and he sends his army to Ai only to get routed, beat, and like chased off by a lesser inferior opponent. And the reason was they actually had taken some things that they weren't supposed to take. Some of those consecrated things in Jericho that they took into their camp. And the, 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 I think the learning principle here about in the, getting into the wrong place is don't get ahead of God. You can get into places, go to places, and that's a fill in there. Don't get ahead of God. There you go. Um, that's a place. You can actually go ahead of God and leave him. Because God, sometimes he's like, I, I actually had... I wanted to do something in that season you left and you got ahead of me. There was something, there was a lesson you did. If you would have sought me, I would have showed you there was something I need to teach you before you go to the next battle, before you go to the next territory, before you go ahead and try to take that next promotion. There was actually something you should have learned here and I ain't there. You can go ahead, but I'm not going with you. You can, you can miss the glory of God in your life because you got ahead of him. Habakkuk chapter two, verse three says, the vision is for a future time. That if it seems slow in coming, don't get ahead of God. Don't rush it. He says, wait, wait for it. Wait patiently for me. Stay here in my glory. You don't want to go without the glory of God. For it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. There's another example of, of maybe just being in the wrong place. A great example of that is, is, is Abraham and Lot. Both of these two communities, actually. Both these people, they're, you know, they... Abraham and Lot started being blessed by God in, in, in the land he had given them. And 
multiply to them and their servants and their land and their kids and their cattle, everything was just, but it got so blessed, both of them, that the land could not support both of them. And there was some fraction between them. So Abraham comes a lot and says, Lot, hey, just, we shouldn't fight between us, man. There's more of this land. Why don't you just look up, look up at the land, wherever you want to go, you go ahead and take it. I'll give you first dibs. Lot looks up, he looks at the land and over on one side, he says, well, that looks good. That's green and lush and the land is fertile. I'm going to take that one. And so he pitched his tent in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. So, so the, the, the learning principle here about being in the wrong place looks may be deceiving. And some of you, some of you, the glory of God has been shoved out of your life because you're in the wrong place. You looked up, you saw something that was glittering, that was shiny, it looked good, and you went and pitched your tent somewhere where God was not, okay? So this is, this is just some, some examples that, hey, how is, how is God, the glory of God, being shoved out of our life? You have the presence of God. If you're a child of God, he lives in you, he dwells in you, but there is something so much more powerful and greater, the glory of God, that you can walk in and manifest in your life. And when, when he's shoved out, it's because maybe some other idols have actually occupied space in your heart, shoving out God's glory. Maybe you got ahead of God or you went somewhere because of the way it looked and you're in the wrong place. God's just not there. And then here's the third reason why we might shove out the glory and God moves out. You're in rebellion. You're straight up. You're in rebellion. This is, this is the cycle of all these three things of the cycle of Israel. It's where they're at. There's, actually, there's, there's two reasons why um, Israel rebelled. The two reasons Israel rebelled all throughout history of Israel, it's still the same reasons why we rebel today, you guys. The same two reasons why anyone rebels. God, number one, we're rebelling against God's standard or we're rebelling against God's saving. Those are the only two. Re That's rebellion. We're rebelling against God's standard. Well, I don't want to do it that way. I'll do it my way. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that part. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it this way. Or we're rebelling against God's saving. We're like, I don't need help. I can, do it my, I can do it my own. I'm not, I, and we just haven't got to that place of, of lowness or humility or brokenness yet. This is, a, this is a dangerous place to be in, especially if you know God. If you know the standard of God and the saving of God, and yet you are rebelling against his goodness and truth anyway, that is a scary place to be in. That's where Israel got. In, in, in fact, it was a cycle. That's, that's where they continued to get there. They're again in Ezekiel, in, in Ezekiel but this is... A great picture of this is in, the, is in the life of Samson. Samson was a judge of Israel, a man who actually the glory of God rested so powerfully on him. It's what gave him supernatural strength. I mean, like, like they, there's like superhero stories written after this guy because of the glory of God that was on his life. But he got complacent and comfortable in his rebellion. Look what it says in Judges chapter 16, verse 20. His wife cries out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. And when he woke up, he thought, I'm just going to do as I did before. I'll shake free. But he didn't realize, look what it says, that the Lord had left him. He didn't realize that the glory that was there ain't even there anymore. And some of us, if we're not careful, we can get to places, just wake up one day, think that it's going to be there when you need it, when the crisis comes, when your kid comes home and says, well, this is what I'm going to do with my life, or you get into some spiritual warfare and you think you can tap into a reservoir that has run dry for years. Didn't re oh, he didn't realize the Lord, what the glory of God isn't there. He moved out. See, the problem isn't where God is. Oftentimes it's where we are. And mankind has a tendency to drift from the presence of God. And, and if there's anything that this, the history of the Old Testament, and even Christianity of our own lives. We have this tendency to just drift. Here's some signs you might be drifting today, okay? Some signs that you may be drifting and the glory dissipating in your life. You spend little, if any time, reading God's word or praying anymore. You might say things like, I'm just too busy right now. It's a busy season. Or maybe the word of God doesn't affect you like it used to. Oh man, I've, I've heard this word a thousand times and I've, yeah, I just don't. Or maybe you say something like this, I just don't feel fed anymore. What a dangerous statement. Sometimes people come to discovery from other churches like, ah, I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling fed over there. I get it. I understand that and all, but that's very dangerous. Whenever I hear that, I'm like, it won't be enough. A little bit of time, you'll be saying the same thing right here because the mature man and woman of God can eat the word of the God no matter where they're at, Okay. <laughs> 
So, so maybe like, like you're blaming, you know, the preacher, but really, you know, maybe you drifted. Y'all don't like this word today, huh? <laughs> maybe some signs you, you, you're just drifting from glory. Maybe the sins, there are some sins that just don't bother you like it used to bother you anymore. This isn't really that bad. It doesn't, doesn't really affect me that much. You keep promising yourself you'll stop. This is the last time. This is the last time I'm looking at porn. I'm telling you, that, that, that's it. You're, you, you find yourself making excuses for the things that you used to reject. Ah, it's just, you know, it's not. It's just innocent. You know, it's just Facebook. I'm just talking to her on Facebook, you know. No big deal. Why is it, why is it so hard to realize when the Lord leaves? There's, the, there's this dissipation that happens of glory from our life. Here's, here's what I, I want to help answer this question with you real quick, and then I'm going to help you get the glory of God back in your life. Some of you need the manifest presence again. You need to come back to a place to the glory, okay? Some of you have never experienced the manifest presence. You have the Holy Spirit. You know, you're saved, but you're not walking in glory. Where there's a, a where people where you would even think of yourself like, God is in this, or people look at you and go, whoo, God is there, Jehovah Shammah. You can have that. I'm going to show you how you get to that place or back to that place today, but let me kind of explain why is it hard to realize when the Lord leaves. Here, write this down. It's because maybe we have great words, but there's no great power with it. See, we, we, get, we know the right things to say. We know the right words to say. We know the right phrases to say. How you doing? Blessed and highly favored of God. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Or whatever it is, you just know the words, but it's lacking power. And some of you here today are facing things that words can't fix. You need the power of God in your life. You need Jehovah Shammah to show up in your life to have a breakthrough. You got a problem bigger than words can fix. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but instead, look what he says. My message didn't come with great video and great music and lights and stuff like that. Here's what happened. It came with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Why? I'm glad you asked. Next line. Look what it says. So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but your faith would rest on God's power. Amen. See, we need to be a, pe- a group of people who are convinced of the power of God, not because someone else said it, but because we've known it and experienced Jehovah Shammah ourself. Like our life has been changed. He showed up. My marriage has been changed. My, my, my future has been changed. The sickness healed, changed by the power of God. Last week, we talked about Jehovah Rapha, and there were so many healings that we're collecting from that. There was someone who, someone who was affected by, by this. I actually said in the service, I don't know if I said it in this one. I said it in some of them, plantar fasciitis. And that's just the Lord put that word. It's it just the bottom. It, it's just a, like a flat foot. It's a really extreme pain, though, with it. There was a dancer here that had plantar fasciitis that was affecting her for years. She came to the altar, got anointed with oil. Her cracking in her feet healed in Jesus' name. She walked out of here and still today, years affected by it. I know it might seem like little to you. Plantar fasciitis, yeah, foot pain. It wasn't to her, okay? It, it wasn't to her. Listen to me, she experienced the power, not just words, but power, okay? Why is it hard to realize that glory is dissipating from our life? Because maybe we got great words, but no great power. Here's the next one. That though there might be some thorough explanation, but without a deep encounter. Like we know how to explain it. We know how to explain Christianity. We know how to explain stuff, but there isn't the deep encounter. Why is this important? In all of my reading and study of scripture, I have not seen or read about one person. In fact, every person in the Bible that had a God encounter, they never questioned God again for their entire life. Never. See, I, I, once they experience the glory of God, once they know him, their faith, listen to me, is no longer based on an intellectual level. It's based on an experience. Now, some of y'all don't like that, but God is an experiential God. He's just not a God that's in your mind and your thoughts and your knowledge base or intellect. That's what Jehovah is, the real, tangible, relational God. He wants to be known by you, okay? So we can't just have the explanation. We need an encounter. 
And I think a lot of us are more comfortable serving a God we understand, though. We shrink God down to the level of our understanding. I love this story when Jesus healed the guy who was born blind, and it made a lot of people upset. It made specifically the religious leaders upset, which, by the way, is most of the time these kind of things happen where God's power shows up. It's the religious people who want to question it. And so these religious people, the Pharisees, come to this guy who got healed miraculously by Jesus, and they start interrogating him and questioning him. Are you really healed? Can you really see? They're just blown. They're all putting up eye charts going, what are the letters? A, B, C. They're all like pushing him around on this, like really leaning in on him. And they're like, what about this Jesus guy? What do you know about him? Are you sure it was him? Is, is, it, was, it, was, it, was it God that did it through him? Was it a demon that did it through him? How do you know? And the, Eventually, this guy responds. It's in your notes in John chapter 9. Finally, they turn to the blind man. What have you to say about him, Jesus? And the guy said, look, guys, I don't know if he's God or not. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. But all I know is I can see. I'm just telling you, I was blind, but now I can see. This guy was convinced, and no one could convince him of anything different. Although he could not explain it, he had an encounter and an experience that was so convincing, they could have beat him. They could have thrown him into prison. He'd be like, I don't care as long as I'm seeing my way to the prison. I don't care. I go to prison. Let's go. I was blind, but now I see. Okay? Listen closely. The proof that Jesus is Lord is changed lives. It's you, it's me, it's the fact that once I was blind, but now I see. It's not that we have the right explanation. It's that we serve a God who can give you that experience, who can show up in your life. Here's the third reason why it's hard to tell when God is moving out and drifting from our life. Because maybe we have the practice of faith, write it down like that, without the presence of God. Meaning we're practicing Christianity. We're practicing religion. We're pra- and, and they're good things. I want you to practice. I teach them. I want you to, I want you to have spiritual disciplines. But, but you can get to a place in this, in this journey of faith where you're just practicing faith and not hosting his presence. Where you're coming to church You could be reading the Bible, and the Pharisees read the Bible, you guys. You could be doing all these things and missing the presence, the glory, the power of God. Listen, guys, I don't want to just practice church. I don't want to have just this religious structure. Let's sing a few songs and, you know, tickle your ears or something, and then let's go eat some fried chicken or something. That's not my... That's not the song and dance that that God desires. I need more than that. How many of you need more than that? I need Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. I need more, a whole lot more than that. Exodus 33, Moses says to God, God, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us from this place in the wilderness. Show me your glory. I want to know the manifest presence, God. I need that. I don't need the promised land. I don't need milk and honey. I don't need you to give me a new job. I don't need a date. I don't need a spouse. Show me your glory, God. That's what I need. Jehovah Shammah, I need you, God, in my life. How do we do that? How do we experience Jehovah Shammah? Let me ask you a question. This is a big question of the day, really, is this. Do you have a role? in any of this happening? Or is it just like luck? Is it like, oh man, you missed it. God showed up. Woo! You missed that, right? Do you, you ever like miss out on something and someone says, oh, God, God was there. Well, do you, do you have any role in God showing up and manifesting himself in your life? I, I believe, and I believe scripture teaches that we have a lot more to do with it then we actually realize, I believe the Bible says that Jesus is throwing out a lot of seed. He's trying to give you uh, moments and encounters and reveal himself to you. But what's happening is it's not falling on the right soil. The heart condition is not ready for the encounter, for Jehovah Shammah, the glory of God to be revealed in our life. In other, re- in other words, the reason why we're not encountering God, it's not be. It's not because we're waiting on God to just show, oh, no, God's waiting on us. God's waiting. It's oftentimes, in fact, in Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus was telling the parable of the seed and the rocky ground and the heart conditions, he says this, in you is fulfilled the prophet of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, you're here, but nothing's happening. 
never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. So you're seeing, it's just not working out that well for you. Why? Because people's hearts has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes is the problem. Otherwise, they try to say, I'm doing, I'm trying to do a work in your life. They might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. In other words, the reason why you're not experiencing Jehovah Shammah is your heart condition. It's not really God, because God actually wants to speak to you and make himself known to you. It's our heart condition. All that said, I think we have a role of preparing God's presence, his glory in our life. And it's to put our hearts in the right condition, the environment where glory can dwell. Hosea gives this prescription in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. He says, sow for yourselves righteousness and reap the fruit of unfailing love. Look what he says though. And break up your unplowed ground. Jesus called it calloused hearts, the hard soil. Hosea says, break up that unplowed, calloused ground in your heart for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes. So what do we do? He says, let's get your heart ready. You want, you want to see the glory of God? Some of you need to come back to a place that Ezekiel prophesied, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. You need to come back to that place where the Lord is there. He is present. His glory is resting in your life. Some of you have never experienced it. I'm going to give you three words today, three steps, three different words that Israel, every time they came back to God, they had to go through these three same things. You have to do the same three things if you want the glory of God to come back into the land, into your heart, manifest it in your life. How many of y'all want that? Come on, are you with me, guys? Three things, three things. Number one is this, you gotta get desperate. Desperation, wanting God's way. You have to, see, desperate conditions don't always cause de a desperate heart. Some of you, like, like even if it's desperate all around, you got to want God's way instead of your way. And God is looking for some people who are not content with what they have. If you're content right now and you're like, oh, this is a great word and stuff. Yeah, God's there, but I'm good. I'm happy for you, but I ain't good. I need more of God, okay? Good for you, but this place, we started Discovery 10 years ago for people who knew there's got to be more to life. That may be unchurched or de-churched. They maybe had even experience with God and a little bit of God, but they came to a place, maybe even just privately in your own thought life, that you said, man, there's just got to be more to God than this. There is, and his name is Jehovah Shammah. He can be there, present in your life. Uh, uh, man, Matthew chapter 5, I gotta hurry. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who want it really bad, Jesus said, those are the people who are gonna be filled. He wants to fill you. But there's a hunger that needs to happen. You gotta get desperate. If you want the glory of God, there needs to be a desperation for the will of God in your life. Number two, humility. Humility. That's what, write it down like this wanting God's will, not just God's way, but God's will in your life. If you want the things of God, you can't do it with pride in your heart. Pride will keep you from experiencing the power and the presence of God more than anything else. Pride will prevent you from experiencing the glory of God. It's true. A lot of us, you might not even know this, but check it out. Some of you have drawn lines in the sand with God. I've seen it all the time. Like, I love God. Yeah. I mean, but I just won't do that. I just can't go there. You know, you, I, I so much... I will draw lines. I just, I love God and stuff, but that tithing thing, I, uh. I, I love God. I love God and all, but, but man, I love her. I love him. And God doesn't mind if we love each other and we're living together and we're having sex and that's okay. I mean, we love each other. I mean, I love God and I, yes, and I want to serve God and amen, but man, love is love. And I can love someone who has the same sex. God doesn't mind that. Look, listen to me. I didn't write the Bible. God did. God, God wrote it. I didn't say it. God did. He's God. We don't get to say, you know what? I don't agree with that part. If you do say that, listen to me. He's not your God. That's what makes him God is he gets to rule and reign in your life. Jesus comes along praying to his father in this Garden of Gethsemane moment. And he tells, let me, let me kind of restate what Jesus said. Here's what Jesus was saying in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know what, Dad? 
This is tough what you're about me to go, what I'm about to go through, and I don't like it. In fact, Dad, I don't do crosses. I mean, can we come up with another plan to save humanity and stuff other than crosses? Because crosses is, is, is I, don't, I don't do crosses. Go read it. It's in there. But then he comes to this place that you need to get to. You, I'm telling you, you need to pray the same prayer. Some of you have drawn lines in the sands. Luke 22, 42, he said, you know what, Abba? Hey, Dad, Abba, I may not want it and I may not like it, but not my will, but your wills be done. Not my way, but your way. Listen to me. Some of you will only have God if he does it your way. And you can't have God that way. I, I want heaven because I sure don't want hell. So I'll take that. And I don't like that, so I'll skip that one, and I'll have some of that, like it's a buffet or something. You're walking along the buffet, and you're like, no, yes, yes, yes. Choosing what to put on the plate. You gotta humble yourself. If you, if you want the glory of God, he's, you gotta let him rule, reign, his standard and his saving. You got to submit humbly to God. You gotta get desperate. You gotta humble yourself. This is what Israel did. But here's number three, the, they probably did this first, but I want to do it last so I can pray this with you. They repented. Repentance. It's a beautiful word. It's a religious word that may scare a lot of you, but all that is is wanting God's work. It's, it's wanting God's work because what I've been working at, it's not working. It's what I've been working at, I'm done with my work, and I'm going to do your work. We got to allow this cleansing work to happen in our heart. The psalmist David, he prayed in Psalm chapter 51, create in me a pure heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Some of you need that today. You need some, a renewal to happen in your heart. Don't, do not cast me from your presence, look what he says, or take your Holy Spirit from, I don't want to drive the glory out of my heart. I don't want to shove you out anymore, God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit even that I would want your way more than my will, that I'd want your work more than my work, that I would submit to it. Give me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Then my life will be a testimony to your greatness. They'll look at me. They'll look at my family. They'll look at my life and they'll say, Jehovah Shammah, what happened to them? What happened? Jehovah Shammah, the Lord must have done. God wants to do it. He wants to be made known this way to you. But some of you need to start right here. Some of you have drawn some lines in the sand. And it's time to pray that prayer of Jesus. Not my will, but yours. Others of you, maybe, um, maybe there's idols occupying space in your heart. But you didn't know. But now that you do know, you need to, you need to respond to the word of God today. With that idol in your heart, you're shoving. You're driving out the glory of God from your life. And some of you, so some of you need to dethrone some stuff, erase some lines, and get desperate, humble, and repent. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.